Hey everyone, welcome to the Singularity Computers water cooling guide. This is actually another client build, but I didn't build this system. All I'm going to be doing is installing a water cooling system into it. This guide is for beginner to intermediate water coolers with some prior PC building knowledge. In this guide, I'm not going to focus on choosing components. I'm actually going to do another video on that coming up soon. I'm going to focus mainly on just building the water cooling system itself, although I'm going to start the guide now by quickly covering the specifications of this system and also the components that I'm going to use to build this custom water cooling loop. So all I'm cooling in this system today is the CPU and graphics card. So the CPU is the Core i7-2600K, the graphics card is the NVIDIA GTX 670. The radiators that I'm going to use is a Black Ice GT Gen 2 Stealth 280mm and a Phobia Extreme 200. The fans I'm going to use is a Silverstone Air Penetrator 180mm, a Noise Blocker XL2 and two Noise Blocker XK2s. I'm also going to use some grills to protect the fan blades. The water blocks I'm using is the XSPC Raystorm and Razor. I'm actually going to give you a closer look at these during the guide because I don't often use XSPC water blocks. I also have an XSPC backplate for the graphics card. The pump is the Swiftec MTP35X with a Bits Power clear pump top. The fittings are going to be Bits Power Black Sparkle. I'll show you the rest of the fittings during the guide. The reservoir I'm going to use is a Bits Power 150mm. The coolant is Mayhem's X1 UV Blue. This 250 ml concentrate actually makes 2 litres, which is plenty for this build. And the tubing is Master Clear Clear UV Blue. Okay, I'm just getting started now on dismantling the system. Because I'm installing a water cooling system in a pre built system, I need to dismantle a lot of it. If you're installing a water cooling system at the same time as you're building your system, you're actually going to save a lot of time compared to installing it later. It's not as if I'm going to have to remove all of the components though, just the graphics card, the CPU cooler, a few fans, and I'm also going to redo all of the cable management. Now that I've removed the CPU cooler, I'm just cleaning the thermal interface material or TIM from the CPU. It's now time to install the XSPC Raystorm onto the CPU. Before I do, I'm just going to give you a quick look. The hold down plate is made from a piece of black brushed aluminium and plexi. The center of the water block appears to be made from acetal, that's where the inlet and outlet is which have G1 quarter inch threads. And the base of the water block, the cold plate, is of course made from copper. It's actually not quite polished to a mirror finish. The water block was really well wrapped. You can see the base of the water block has a cover on it, it was also vacuum packed and then wrapped in bubble wrap. So this is the piece of plexi underneath the hold down plate and this is really what the aesthetics of this water block is all about because it has two 3mm LED mounts in it. So once you install LEDs it lights up the top of the water block. You'll actually see that later in the guide. Okay I'm now installing the back plate for the XSPC Raystorm. Now this actually has sticky pads on it so it does stick on which makes it a lot easier. If your case has a cutout for changing out backplates, this is going to be easy. This is all you need to do. If it doesn't, you actually need to remove the entire motherboard just to install the backplate. So obviously before I mount the water block, I need to install some thermal paste. I definitely recommend using a high performance thermal paste in combination with water blocks. There's a lot of different ways of installing thermal paste. You know, everyone does it differently, but I recommend applying it evenly and thinly. All of this needs to be done with the motherboard horizontal. It's really not much different to installing any other CPU cooler in that what's most important is even contact and even pressure. So once you've applied the thermal paste, sit the water block into position. Each water block is going to have a different mounting system, but I just tighten the standoffs until they're almost touching the top of the hold down plate. I then start in one corner and go around to the opposite standoffs and tighten them about half a turn, maybe a full turn each time until you've reached the end of the threads. Okay, I'm just about to start mounting the radiators into the case. Always before you use a radiator in a water cooling loop, you need to flush it out. Some people flush all of their components, but I find it's only necessary to flush radiators because they're the only component that have gunk in them. 
Now, some people are probably going to whine about this because there is more advanced ways of doing it. But this way is quick and easy, and if you do it properly, it is highly effective. There's no need to use a more advanced way than this. Now, just go to your, your kitchen sink, your bathroom, maybe your bath, and take the caps off and fill the radiator up. Fill it from both the inlet and outlet and keep it horizontal while you're doing that. Then you just need to put the caps back on, give it a really good shake, and then tip the water out. Keep doing this until no more gunk comes out of the radiator. If you can't see anything coming out of it, just do it five times, maybe 10 times if you're feeling a bit more fussy. The, the last time you do it should be done with distilled or deionized water. Now, this is if you're really fussy. I mean, if there's a bit of tap water left behind, it's not going to harm your loop. So you don't really need to worry about that one, mainly if you you know, try your best to get all of the tap water out. So I'm now going to mount the 280 millimeter radiator into the roof of the case. There's a lot to think about when you start mounting your radiators. First of all, you do need to think about your tubing routing because the orientation of the, your radiators is going to affect your tubing routing because the inlet and outlet is only on one side, depending on the radiators that you go for. You can get cross flow radiators and, and things like that, but that's for my other video on choosing components. Now, I don't have any choice with, with the orientation of these radiators. They have to go a certain way and I just have to design my tubing routing around that. The other thing you need to think about is fan orientation and the thermal design in your case. Now with the thermal design, there is two things to think about. Convection, so work with convection, and also positive pressure. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm mounting a radiator into the front of the case and one in the roof. Working with convection, the fan in the front of the case is low down, it's going to bring the cold air in. The fans at the top of the case are going to exhaust the hot air out. So that answers that. Now positive pressure. This is something I've been doing for years. It's a really simple way of preventing dust. All it is, you need to have more fans blowing air in than out. If you do this, it means that all of the air in the case is going out through all the little gaps. The only air coming into the case is, is through the intakes. And as long as you have them filtered, you're not going to get any dust. If you have negative pressure inside of your case, more fans sucking in than blowing out, it means that all of the air is going to get sucked in through all of the little gaps which aren't dust filtered. So very simple dust prevention. Now, the other thing you need to think about is which side of the radiators you want to mount the fans. And it's really up to you, although I have seen test results that that prove that with lower RPM fans, having the, the fans sucking through the radiators is more beneficial. With higher RPM fans, having the fans blowing through the radiators is more beneficial. So that's something to think about. Now, mounting bolts. You do get bolts with your radiators, but I find they are almost never suitable. If you're mounting your fans between the, like sandwiching your fans between the case and the radiator, it means you need one set of long bolts to go, you know, through the case, through the fan and into the radiator. You can get away with about 35 millimeter. If you're doing what I'm doing and mounting the fans on the inside, it means you need two sets of bolts, one short set, one longer set. So what I used at the top, I, I mounted grills, so it gave me a bit of extra thickness. I needed to use 35 millimeter to mount the fans to the radiator. And on the other side, I used four millimeter to mount the radiator to the case. So that just gives you an idea. Some radiators use M3 bolts, some radiators use M4s. Basically, it's highly likely you're going to need to purchase some nuts, bolts, and washers separately. Not just for mounting your radiators, also components such as your reservoir and pump. If you don't want to plan it all out, just to give you an idea, I use M3s and M4s. I use 5mm, 30mm and 35mm most of the time. And to mount both of the radiators I needed 8 bolts and then to mount the pump and reservoir I'll probably need another 4 bolts or so. 
it's now time to start thinking about tubing routing and component order. There's a lot of people that think that component order is critical, but it's actually not. The coolant moves so fast around the loop that it heats up not at each component, but after many revolutions of the loop, and by that time it's been past the radiators many times and started to cool down. So what's more important about component order is the following three rules that I've come up with that I'm going to give you to make things a lot easier. Now, if you follow these rules, you can create a loop that functions well, performs well, and also looks amazing. So first of all, go around in a circle with your tubing. What I mean by this is never cross tubing. Next, you need to take the shortest route between all of your components. It's actually a puzzle because there is only one shortest route and you have to find it. Now, I did say that component order doesn't matter, but there is two components that need to be in a specific order. The reservoir needs to be directly before the pump and directly above the pump. All of these rules can be broken, but if you do, it's going to have a negative impact on the functionality, performance, and aesthetics of your loop. I'm now going to mount the reservoir. Now, there's a lot of different options for reservoirs. Today, I'm using a tube reservoir, and I'm going to mount it to the back of the 5.25 inch bays. There's a lot of different possible mounting positions for reservoirs in you know, different cases. This is only one of the possibilities for this particular case. I prefer this mounting position because it's fairly high up in the case and mounting the reservoir up as high as you can is important. If you put it down too low, you know, when you switch off the system, if you take the cap off the reservoir, you often get a lot of backflow all of the coolant will leak out of the top of the res. So it is important that it's up high also because the pump needs to be underneath it. Now what I'm using to mount it is the mounts that actually came with the reservoir and also something called an EK uni holder. Now it doesn't matter what kind of a water cooling system you're planning on building, I recommend you get some EK uni holders because they're useful in a whole bunch of different situations. Also to mount the reservoir, I used the nuts, bolts and washers that I mentioned previously. In this case, I'm using M3s. So the reservoir is mounted and at the top of this reservoir, there's just a single opening, which is obviously going to be the fill port. At the bottom, there is three openings. I'm going to use one of these openings for the tube coming back to the reservoir and one of them for the pump. It's now time to take a look at the fittings. Now, fittings is really one of the most complex parts of building a water cooling system, but in this video, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to talk a lot more about fittings coming up in my other video on choosing components. Basically, it comes down to two choices, whether you wanna use compression fittings or barb fittings, and the only real difference between the two is price and aesthetics. Some people prefer the aesthetics of barbs, some people prefer the aesthetics of compression fittings. They, they really do the same thing. A lot of people think that compression fittings is going to mean less potential leaks, but as long as you use good clamps on your barb fittings, then they're both just as safe. The price difference in Australian dollars, barb fittings you can get for approximately three to five dollars. Compression fittings are more like seven to twelve dollars, so they are a lot more expensive. And it really adds up quickly if you consider how many fittings you actually need in your loop. Now, as a beginner, really you should just be sticking with either compression fittings or barb fittings. But if you really want to get that tubing length down and improve your aesthetics, this is going to cost you a lot more though, then you can use different types of angle fittings. So I have here all of the different fitting types that I'm about to use in this water cooling loop. Now, really, I should do another guide on fittings entirely. There is so much to learn about fittings. I am going to talk a lot more about them in my upcoming video on choosing components for your water cooling system. As a beginner, if you want to stick with compression fittings or barb fittings, then that's perfect. But if you do want to go further, if you want to learn more about fittings, then I suggest you check out some of my build logs. Basically, it's just a matter of doing some research and checking out as many water-cooled builds as you possibly can. Another thing you need to think about when choosing your fittings is the tubing diameter you want to use in your build. Now, I always use half-inch tubing. It doesn't matter what I'm building, so I suggest you do the same. So the fittings you need to buy, they should have a G1 quarter inch thread. That's basically just the standard, but they should be for tubing, with a half inch ID and a three quarter inch OD. 
So that's a half inch internal diameter and a three quarter inch external diameter. Okay, I've gone ahead and skipped a few steps here to show you what we are working towards. I'm now going to go back and explain how to do all of this. All I've actually done, I've installed the pump, I've started tubing up, and I've also installed most of the fittings. Now, I just want you to overlook the complex configurations that I've done with the fittings. Because as I said, that's another guide in itself. What I'm going to stick with here is just teaching you how to tube up with compression fittings and barb fittings. The rest is just something that you can aspire to, something that you can work towards. If you are confident doing it, then that's fine, go ahead. But for this guide, I wanted to keep it simple. Just to give you an idea, that configuration between the pump and the 200 millimeter radiator is worth over $100. I've also included a drainage system in that but it looks you know incredibly clean the aesthetics are amazing i've also included something called bits power crystal link it's the hard tubing that's actually designed for multiple graphics card water cooling configurations something else you need to consider while you're building a your loop is how you're actually going to drain it now you can just drain it from a fitting that is low down in the build if you can get a container into the case and underneath it but this is a configuration that I recommend. It's even great for beginners because it's very simple, it's effective, and it's also not that expensive. This is a coolant VL4 and quick disconnect. It has a compression fitting on either side. It's no spill and it cuts the flow as soon as you, you know, undo it. So what I recommend is having two of these, one in the loop and one for draining. So when it comes time to drain your loop, you get your spare, you hook a piece of tubing up to it and you just connect it into your loop and drain your loop. Obviously you'll need to put this low down in the loop so that you can drain it properly. Now for a look at the XSPC Razor. So same aesthetics as the Ray Storm. It's going to match up nicely in this build. Black brushed aluminium plate on the base. Plexi in the middle with two 3mm LED holes. So that lights up nicely with LEDs installed. And then there's another what looks like an aluminium plate in between and then the copper. You can see the standoffs are actually brass so you're not going to have any problems with those threads being soft. The only thing that I don't really like about the aesthetics is the inlet and outlet. It's really big and bulky but take a look at all of the options that it gives you. There's actually seven openings so that's excellent. There's even an extra one out the side. So really it's a great looking water block and it's going to look you know amazing once it's installed okay i already have a separate graphics card water block installation guide video i'll put a link on the screen to that i'm not going to include one in this water cooling guide this guide is already going to be long enough i'm also doing an updated graphics card water block installation guide coming up really soon I can understand that installing a graphics card water block is daunting for beginners because you're dealing with something that is often very expensive, it's delicate and it's complex. But as long as you follow the instructions that come with your graphics card water block and you take your time, you double check everything, you're not going to have any problems. Now I'm also going to be installing a backplate with this graphics card water block by client request. Backplates are not mandatory. Most of the time they're purely for aesthetics. In some cases they'll help with cooling. So it's a great looking backplate, black powder coat. It's going to go nicely with the water block. Insulation of a backplate, I mean if you can install a water block, you can definitely install the backplate. Often backplates and water blocks go together, so you need to use the same mounting components to mount both the backplate and water block. And that's what I had to do in this case. So here it is, the installation is finished. Before I install the graphics card, I'll just give you a quick look around. It's incredible how short the GTX 670 is without the stock cooler. It's a great looking configuration. The, the backplate goes really well with the water block and you know it all matches up really nicely with the CPU water block. So I think it's going to look great once we install some LEDs and to get this thing up and running. The graphics card is installed and it's now time for me to take you through the process of finishing off the tubing. Now whether you're using compression fittings or barb fittings, both are very straightforward and easy to use. I will say that with compression fittings you need to have the outside of the compression fitting pushed onto the tubing ready to go and with barbs, whatever you're using for clamps, you also might want to have them you know, pushed on the tubing ready to go. 
Then it's just a matter of pushing the tubing onto the fitting and to make this a bit easier, some people will heat the tubing. What I do is I use some coolant or distilled water on the inside of the tubing to make it easier to push onto the fitting. And this is important because you can see I'm supporting the fitting with my other hand and this is so that I move the graphics card around the, the least amount possible. You need to give that some good support because to get that tubing on requires a lot of twisting and a lot of pressure. The distilled water or, or coolant or whatever you use will help with that but you still need to make sure you support it because I was doing my very best to support it just then and you can see how much the graphics card was still moving. And you can actually rip the, the PCI Express slots right off the motherboard, damage the graphics card, you need to watch out for that. And that goes for any other component you're connecting to also. Now it's just a matter of tightening the compression fitting. Now, when you do this, never use tools. Always hand tighten the fittings. Uh, and that goes for when you're tightening the fittings you know, into each other, into the water blocks and other components, and also when you're tightening the compression fittings. The other thing I'll do here is use, again, a bit of distilled water or coolant on the outside of the tubing to help the, the outside of the compression fitting, you know, tighten a bit more. So you can see I've almost tightened that right to the end just with my, by hand tightening it, and that was very easy to do. Now it's time to cut the tubing to length, and it is critical that you get it to exactly the right length. If it's too short, it's going to pull the components together. If it's too long, it's going to have a bend in it and look terrible. Now, you can see what I'm using for tubing cutters. These are fairly big and bulky, but they do an excellent job. They get a straight cut. Don't just use a straight knife or Stanley knife or scissors or anything like that. You're going to get terrible cuts. Use a proper pair of tubing cutters that's going to get you a nice straight cut because that is important. This is one of the ways you can end up getting leaks. If you're careful when you're tightening all of your fittings and you do everything properly, double check everything, you know, don't settle for anything less than absolutely perfect. You're not going to get any leaks. Anyway, you can see all I did, I actually marked the length of the tubing that I needed with my thumbnail. If you don't get the length of the tubing right the first time, then that's okay, you can try it again. And you'll probably come up with your own ways of doing these things. Okay, that's the end of part one. I'm going to have to leave it here. Part two will follow directly on. That sums up this video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and favorite if you want to see more.